he has to be actually convinced again and again by the Virgin Mary and God and finally Christ himself to lay off using the Ars Notoria. But he finally does become convinced that it's those names and letters in there that are creating the problems for him with the actual dreams. Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to Glitch Bottle, where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. I'm Alexander Eth, and today on the podcast, we are esoterically elated to welcome professor, author, and scholar, Dr. Claire Fanger. Dr. Fanger is Associate Professor of Religion at Rice University, and she's a medievalist with a research focus on understandings and practices of Latin Christianity in the later Middle Ages, as well as having a central focus on texts and manuscripts of magic, especially angel magic in a Christian context. Many listeners are familiar with Claire's work. She is the editor of two field-defining collections on this very topic, Invoking Angels, Theurgic Ideas and Practices from the 13th through the 16th centuries published in 2012, and Conjuring Spirits, Texts and Traditions of Medieval Ritual Magic, published in 1998. And it was in Conjuring Spirits that I first came across Claire's exquisite editing and gathering together of various scholars in a variety of disciplines, surveying magical texts and manuscripts like the Sworn Book of Honorius, the Ars Notoria, and so many more. And in many ways, it was in that tome that I saw Claire and her colleagues, like Richard Kickheffer, leading the conversation about esoteric esoteric research and bringing to light magical manuscripts into both the academic and the public mainstream, and all of this happening years before what could be termed a veritable explosion in grimoire publications and commentaries over the last 15 years or so. So many listeners, myself included, were very excited to offer questions to Claire as among the first scholars to bring these texts to light. And I really hope you enjoyed this chat as much as I did. We discussed Claire's background, her study of prophecy, prayers, and dreams, and how this specifically relates to angel magic, Claire also shares her thoughts and research on a very important 14th century French monk, John of Morigny, who cultivated visions of the Virgin Mary and authored a very complex prayer system that allowed its operators to gain Mary's visionary assistance in various knowledge projects. Now, John's magnum opus, The Flowers of Heavenly Teaching, was until lately known only through a chronicle report of its burning in 1323 as a heretical revival of condemned magic. Claire talks about this specific text and about John of Morigny and about his very, very important connection to the current day knowledge and understanding of the Ars Notoria. Claire also answers listener questions and we talk about so much more. And now to help us uncork the uncommon, I give you Dr. Claire Fanger. Dr. Claire Fanger, thank you so much for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to chat on the podcast. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be here, Alex. Claire, you were really leading the conversation, you and your colleagues, years before this kind of recent grimoire explosion we've seen over the last 15 years. Can you just share, Claire, with our listeners a little bit about what was the genesis of your interest in angelic magic and, and magical manuscripts? Where did this come from? In a sense, it sort of dropped into my lap with the very first copy of a John of Morigny manuscript that my colleague and I Nicholas Watson found, and it was actually Nicholas. So I had just finished up a dissertation. I had written a dissertation on magic at the University of Toronto, which I don't even know how they let that happen. Like everybody just pretty much let me do what I wanted. I was interested in sort of constructing how magic fit into a sort of worldview and what influenced the way people thought about it. It was intellectual history, really. I'd done, you know, the requisite amount of manuscript work, but I hadn't really spent a lot of time in art. Archives. And then what happened was there was a year that was back in the early 90s, kind of 
sometime before Conjuring Spirits came out, maybe a few years before, my colleague Nicholas Watson had been asked to do a five-minute, they were making an educational video about the manuscript collection at McMaster, and there was a book in the in their collection which had mostly, they had seemed to get a big dump of books that weren't cataloged yet, and they handed him, and this never happens, like you never get someone just handing you a 15th century manuscript and say, go home and, and take a look at it and come back ready to deliver a five-minute spiel on it for a video, but it was just labeled prayer book, and they thought it looked like it was up his alley, so he actually got to, I believe, take this book home. If not, he photocopied the whole thing, I know that. As he was kind of leafing through the pages, he started realizing he'd never seen a prayer book quite like it before. One of the things about it was that it had this suite of prayers addressed to the orders of angels for the liberal arts, so that was kind of something he hadn't seen yet. And then he came to a spot in it where there was actually a, a directive within the text saying, don't go any further until you have a vision. Like there's a, say this, say the last prayer over again until you have a vision of an angel or something like that. And he was like, wait a minute, this never happens. He called up everybody he knew that knew something about magic, which included me and Richard Kickheffer and Frank Clausen. And, and Frank and I, as I said, I had just got my dissertation finished and Frank was still working on his I think I think he finished up a couple of years later at Toronto and we all put our heads together and Frank had immediately said this sounds kind of like an Ars Notoria and Richard Kickheffer remembered that there was an Ars Notoria a weird variety of one that had been burned in 1323 and so we're kind of scratching our heads the thing about this manuscript was it didn't have that it was missing the first 15 folios so there was no introduction to it and it kind of starts in medius res with a prayer and the prayers initially in fact throughout there's they have a lot of very conventional aspects so it's only when you get into the like liberal arts prayers that it starts looking really weird if we'd had the beginning of it we have found other manuscripts of the same type now. There was no name of author, there was no title or anything like that at the front end. We know that if we'd found other manuscripts of the same type, we would have got that, and eventually we did. So so here we had this mystery, and actually that was literally where I started, and I just couldn't let all my questions about that go unanswered. So we started like hunting around for other manuscripts right away, and within a few years had located several, most of them through the Hill Monastic Manuscript Library in Minnesota, actually, most of the early ones that we located. Nicholas, Richard, and I all each had an article in Conjuring Spirits on this text, and what was really inconvenient about it was that most of the, <laughs> the manuscripts turned up just days before I was supposed to send the book to the press. Um, so Nicholas got hold of them first, and he said, you know, Claire, there's like a different beginning and ending to this in the manuscript that I've just got. And this is like so weird. It's a, it's all about the visions that this guy had. You have got to look at this. We can't go to press without actually reading this. So he got me the manuscript. Back then we had to use um, big fat microfilm readers. So I got the manuscript and I was sitting there and reading it and we ended up just putting in a, a kind of synopsis of that preliminary autobiography we got in the Gratz manuscript. So that's how I got hooked into it. And then after that, when the study got really serious and we and new manuscripts kept kind of falling into our laps and so on, that's when I started actually going and spending time in the archives in Europe and looking for more and trying to figure out more about sort of the history and dissemination and everything of John of Morigny's work. But they were quite exciting moments. And it was really, I mean, I, I, even though I did have an intellectual of history background at that point, because I'd done a dissertation on it, Everything that was happening at that point was so new to me. I mean, it, it was just like I've had to, I feel like I had to kind of work up the knowledge I needed to be able to read this text from scratch, essentially. So between 1998, when Conjuring Spirits came out, and we had just got a new manuscript that actually had the autobiographical 
beginning. Now, like 2018, 2019, like it took 20 years for us to go over stuff, to transcribe things, to put together what was going on, the different phases and stages and so on, and come out with the edition, which changed form so many times over like the two decades that we were just had it in process. One of the things about working like manuscript discoveries and working with manuscripts is that it's very easy to have developed an almost completed piece of work and have all these hypotheses about it and then you find one new thing and you realize and you got to throw it all out the window right so you got to kind of start not completely from scratch but you have to re-put together all the phases of it there's two subsequent discoveries 2004 I found in the Bodleian Library at Oxford the unique so far as we know a unique copy of the old compilation text one that was actually condemned in 1315, before the burning in 1323, and which John had written, completely rewritten the last third of. And so the one that we had was kind of imprinted on and referenced an earlier draft of the text, and none of us could figure out exactly what that was about, and suddenly that turned up. So we had all these hypotheses about what the old text looked like that were just completely, we had to completely rewrite our articles, and we had to completely reconfigure our notion of the edition. And then we got another manuscript quite late in the process that we found in Bologna, which is a new compilation version of the text, but it has some pieces of old compilation stuff that do not exist in the Bodleian manuscript. And it also had a series of, like a whole suite of completely different and correct readings in places where we could tell that the other new compilation manuscripts had kind of got messed up in transmission. They were very much clarified by the Bodleian manuscript, but the Bologna manuscript showed for the first time that there was a place where that so the whole copying tradition, mostly the new compilation manuscripts we found are untouched by any apparent contact with the old compilation text, except in this one case, the Bodleian one, where we had something kind of mixed. So both of those like threw off our whole editing process and all the theories that we had about how the text came together. And it was really only after we found the Bodleian manuscript was, as I said, it was quite late. It was after I moved to Houston and we published in 2015. So, and I moved to Houston in 2000 so somewhere in those five years. And I found other copies of like John of Morini manuscripts, of course, they keep turning up, right? I haven't found one in a couple of years, but they do keep turning up. I think most people are familiar with the Arsenatoria in Robert Turner's translation, known as like that fifth book in the back of the Lamegaton. Right. And it's it's all these Latin prayers and these prayers that, yeah, you got to say, but then you got to get to the, you just got to do some of that stuff so that you can really engage with the Goetia. But then all of a sudden, reading Conjuring Spirits, I was blown away, not only about the in-depth examinations that you and the other authors make in terms of the Arsenatoria, but the reason that we know so much about the Arsenatoria in terms of how it was perceived back in you know, mm-hmm. the, the 1300s, the 1400s, the 1500s, was because of this 14th century French Benedictine monk, John of Morigny. Can you share with our listeners about why John the monk is so important for understanding the Arsenatoria? I think the main thing that I realized reading John's, I call it a memoir. There's actually sort of memoir stuff that's laced throughout his ritual text, but the opening pages are specifically designed to be a memoir that introduces readers to the text. So a lot of what it actually talks about is his use of the Ars Notoria, how he found it and how he used it, and also the visions that he actually achieved with it. And one of the things that becomes fairly clear reading John is the extent to which the Ars Notoria was perceived by John and used as a way of inducing specifically visionary dreams This is something that's also very clearly true of his own text, which is in some ways, like like aside from the memoir portion, this is something that you don't get with, you have no record of use of the Ars Notoria outside John, to my knowledge, so far. And his really actually qualifies as a record of use. And what he describes doing with the prayers, one of the things that we've deduced after kind of comparing his own text with various versions of the Ars Notoria is that a lot of his 
a sort of organization of his own book, which is very closely modeled on the Ars Notorio with some Phillips at the beginning and at the end. He was working with a kind of shortened version of it called the Opus Operum, the work of works. And a lot of the language that actually comes up in John of Morini's text come from the Opus Operum. What he describes doing with the Ars Notoria is he'll say something like, I was having a lot of really difficult dreams that I didn't understand how to interpret. They were kind of bad, and I wanted to get some news about them. So I said this prayer, and he identifies the prayer from the Ars Notoria that's good for getting visionary dreams. So there actually are instructions instructions within the Ars Notoria that suggest this can be done, but I don't know that anybody had really thought about the mechanism of it before or what people actually use the text to do. So a lot of what John targets when he's going at the Ars Notoria, he doesn't really describe getting the liberal arts, but what he does describe is saying prayers, and then he'll say something like, so I said the prayer, and then I laid down in bed, and then I had the following vision. And he uses the words vision and dream, visio and somnium, interchangeably. And then he will describe all of the things that went on. He has other types of visions, too, like ones that are not so clearly somnia, but although sometimes a little bit hard to tell. But for the most part, what he's talking about are somnia, which appear to occur kind of on the edge of sleep, because he always seems to slip into a dream. Really, he doesn't wait for his REM sleep, you know. He's like, lies down, and then I saw this. And so I think that he's really, first off, fairly well trained at slipping in and out of sleep and able to track and maybe even to some extent manipulate his period of hypnagogic images. That's the sense that I get anyway. I may be radically speculating, but let me just stick with the facts that I think we can say for sure. The Ars Notoria was used to induce dreams, certainly by John by both of the people in his circle, which included his sister and another monk that was a friend of his that he probably met at the University of Orléans, John of Fontaine-Jean. And they had different degrees, like his sister seemed to share his capacity for actually visualizing things really clearly. She had no difficulty with having dreams from it. Now, John actually used the Ars Notoria to teach her to read, and so that's where she started to interact with it. Whereas he says of his other friend, John of Fontaine-Jean, Jean, that he had more difficulty. And in fact, at one point, he says that John of Fontaine Jean didn't have, for a, after a long period of use, the dreams that are normal for most people using this kind this text. So John may be relying in part on kind of verbal exchanges with other people that had used it. He may be relying on his own usage and, and sort of deep knowledge of what the text instructs. But I would guess there's probably an oral element that plays into it. He doesn't literally say that because he says in throughout his memoir, he depicts himself as the expert. He's the one that teaches others how to do it. But it's interesting that he tracks different levels of adeptness, so to speak, at this acquisition of knowledge through dreams. And John was not as good at it. And the one dream that he does have, ironically or not, is a dream that in which he learns that the Ars Notoria is bad <laughs> and that he shouldn't be using it. He has to read it kind of allegorically. The dream is something like he walks into a library and he sees a friar or a monk in there reading a psalter, a glossed psalter, and he walks over and looks over his shoulder and the friar, I think it is, says to him, what you seek is not here. And then that's it. But he reads that as meaning that what he's seeking from the Ars Notoria is not in the psalter, i.e. is not the word of God. He interprets that dream and comes out of it with a certain belief that the Ars Notoria isn't what he should be using. So and it's very interesting, that would be the very first dream that he managed to have that had a bit of divine information in it. But that seems to be the practice that's described by John and that he's this being implemented in his circle is all about dreams. And in fact, his own work, sort of towards the end, in the Book of Figures. This is in the 1315 redaction where he had to rewrite the Book of Figures. And he actually has three long passages, long chapters in the book where he's defending it against the people that attacked it. And one of the things that obviously happened beyond the fact that they accused him of having figures in it that looked too much like necromantic figures was that they were attacking the whole system of creating a method for inducing dreams. And so he defends dream divination by saying things like, it happens all the time in the Bible. It's 
it's very clear that God gives messages to people through dreams. And there's nothing wrong with my science of dreams. He's made something that he sees as a science of dreams, that he's drawn knowledge from the Ars Notoria and from his own dream manipulations in the Ars Notoria to create. To that point, Claire, one of the really interesting things you bring up about John the Monk is that one of the main reasons why he created this or, or put together his book of prayers, book of figures, and book of visions under kind of the flowers of heavenly teaching was that there was a deep involvement with the Virgin Mary, but also that in the Ars Notoria, can you comment, Claire, on the fact that John looked at this and said, wait a second, or got the permission from Mary to realize that, wait a second, a lot of these kind of, you know, barbarous names and words, although some of them are a mix of Latin and Hebrew and Greek and Arabic, that interspersed in there, or with the combination thereof, there are also these kind of unholy names and names that could engage the operator with demons, and therefore, John said, well, the Virgin Mary gave me permission with this flowers of heavenly teaching. Can you just can you just elaborate on that? Okay, so I'll just go through the set of reactions that John had to the Ars Notoria when he first found it. So he first approaches it as a kind of salubrious alternative for necromancy. He had taken down or sort of got a necromantic handbook from a colleague. He copied it. He was worried about using it. And he went to a doctor that was supposed to know something about this stuff. And he said, what do you think? Should I do this? And the doctor said, no, uh, there's a book called the is Notoria. You can get it from the from the library. It won't corrupt your soul. It will allow you to get all the knowledge you want about necromancy and other things besides if you just work work with that. So then he starts working from the Ars Notoria. So he's when he first learns about it, it's something that is good and it's salubrious and it's not potentially corrupting to his soul the way necromancy would be as, as something everyone knew. So and when he first opened it and looked at it, he said he thought it was the most beautiful beautiful book and of all books he had ever seen the most holy and it was decorated and it had pictures of angels in it and we have found Ars Notoria manuscripts like that and that they also have the Ars Notoria also has these prayers in a macaronic mix of tongues as you just said the Ars Notoria itself was condemned on a number of different grounds prior to John John didn't seem to know about the previous condemnations of the text when he first approached it. And I think other people probably had a similar sort of double take. They'd look at it and they'd go, oh, well, this looks really nice. This looks like a prayer book. This looks like something that I could use, right? There are these long strings of unintelligible names, which um, the only person I know that's actually tried to say them is Frank Kloss. And he's tried reading them out loud because he's interested in how these things work. And he says that they're really difficult. Like they focus, they force a certain type of focus on the words. They're very hard to read out loud because they're not, they don't include kind of expected patterns of syllables and letters and terminology that can be recognized. And he thinks there may be something in the very difficulty of actually apprehending the words individually that is potentially enhancing some particular cognitive feature. That is, it's like swinging two bats, maybe, if you're a person that has difficulty reading, for example. These are all considered highly problematic by the people that condemned the text, the theologians that condemned it, because you weren't supposed to just go saying the names of any angels. And they are described as angel names in, within the text, so you're really not supposed to just go saying names of any angels, because who knows what you'll get, right? There was a possible split between people that used it and, got, and did learn stuff. John claims to have learned the several liberal arts using the Ars Notoria. So if people found that it had uh, some kind of effective learning enhancing product in the use of it and probably were reluctant to condemn it right off the bat. And there were other people that just looked at it and went, no, those names, no, don't say that. Those are going to be bad. John, I mean, who knows why, but his own view, he didn't start out condemning the names in it. But when he has a certain number, like he had a a lot of dreams that really approach nightmares, although they have uncertain and ambiguous qualities too, but there are demons that certainly appear to him. I mean, this doesn't really ever stop. He's a monk. Monks, they confront demons all the time, but he gradually realizes and then finally actually learns in a vision from the Ars Notoria that the reason he's getting so many demons in these dreams, and he has some really bad dreams too, is that they've actually carefully and subtly injected their own names into these 
macaronic prayers. So we don't know. There's no way of knowing which are the demon names. Some of them probably are angel names, maybe. You don't know. So that was his reason for, part of his reason. Like, he has to be actually convinced again and again by the Virgin Mary and God and finally Christ himself to lay off using the Ars Notoria. But he finally does become convinced that it's those names and letters in there that are creating the problems for him with the actual dreams. So what is clear here, I think, is that he doesn't see anything wrong with the practice itself. He doesn't see anything wrong with a devotional practice for acquiring knowledge. That, to him, seems perfectly natural and reasonable thing to do. And he sees that there's a problem with the demonic name. So when he asks for his own set of 30 prayers for taking the liberal arts from the Virgin Mary, and she licenses this for him, she says, yes, you can do this. He sees it in part as a new art that will allow people, all the people that are interested in the Ars Notoria but can't use it because of the demonic apparitions, it's a thing that will destroy the Ars Notoria by replacing it, essentially supplanting it. And it, his own art doesn't include strings of names. Those are basically extracted from the prayers, and the prayers that he writes are pretty much all new, although they repurpose some of the language, especially from the Opus Operum, and some of the petitionary language especially. But even still, he's elaborating the petitions for the liberal arts with other words of his own, and he's got quite long stretches that don't occur anywhere in the Ars Notoria that probably came out of his collaboration with the Virgin. And when he gets to the Book of Figures, he does a few things that are a little bit more Ars Notoria-like in that he's got kind of strings of letters. There's one spot in the, in the old compilation text where he says, if you see letter forms that you don't understand or things that you don't understand, don't worry about it. <laughs> Okay, John, fine, I won't worry about it. It's perhaps significant that that is the part of the text that he had a little difficulty with that got critiqued. To that point, Claire, we have a question from a listener, Michael Molino Swan, who says, could you please ask Claire about the use of the no tie illustrations in the Ars Notoria? Specifically, how much do we know about the precise manner in which the no tie were employed during the reciting of the orations? And were they used to induce an altered state of consciousness? And I guess, Claire, this question could be applied to both the book of figures with John the Monk, and also the no tie of the Ars Notoria. Like, these are amazing illustrations. Can you share about their place and their significance? So everything that I say is going to be a little bit speculative, probably. I'm going to just narrow this down a great deal to, we know the things that the texts themselves say. So, Within the Ars Notoria, I described earlier, probably making a hash of it, but how we have these unknown names that have a certain, they're, they're quite difficult to say. What's going on in the, a lot of the notai, many of them, though not all, are inscribed with prayers. Some of them with quite a lot of prayer material, like the opening uh, note of grammar, I believe, has uh, concentric circles with prayers kind of going all the way in, in most of the older manuscripts. And one of the instructions that you get on this note is not to read the prayers, just look at it which I think is kind of interesting. Like it, it bespeaks a kind of focus that's a little bit divided because at the same time as you look at these figures, you are also reciting prayers. And that right there is an interesting kind of thing to think about. Like, how do you stop yourself from reading the prayer that, well, it's, it's actually kind of hard to read because of the way that it's written and so on. So what does this presuppose about the practice? Probably one thing I would say is that you've got to have the figure itself before you really internalize it and can simply visualize it. You're, you have to have the figure itself somewhere that you can see it. And you probably have to have the prayer memorized memorized in order to do the practice so that one of the things that's going on is that you're memorizing a prayer and you're saying it or perhaps sub-vocalizing it while you're looking at this figure which as you probably know is kind of like it's not it's less diagrammatic than something more like an anti-diagram as Michael Camille calls it in his article so that's one thing that we know in the practices of John of Morigny we get a little bit more particularly in the old compilation book of figures about what he's expecting you to do. And he has also got a first figure, which is 
fortunately preserved in the Bodleian manuscript, which I've reproduced in, in a few places, I think. It's certainly in the plates to the edition. So you're supposed to be doing several things at the same time. You've got to stare at this figure, which is a figure of the tetragrammaton in which there's a kind of a cross drawn through the middle, and you've got the letters yod he vav he, the letters of the tetragrammaton in Latin letters written around it. The tetragrammaton is actually quite important to his old compilation of figures, which it appears the tetragrammaton is supposed to actually appear in every figure, but anyway, this very first one. And it has a prayer that goes with it, and the, in the prayer, the tetragrammaton is actually interspersed First, with a gloss from Jerome in which each letter of God's name is read onto an aspect of the death of Christ so that he sort of moshes together Jewish and Christian idea of the Tetragrammaton. Really interesting in and of itself. So you're supposed to be saying this prayer that goes with the figure while looking at the figure while visualizing that you are on the road to paradise. So this is like a sort of triple layered practice in which you've got three things going on at the same time. You're focusing your attention on three different layers of stuff that you're doing. He has visualizations actually throughout the latest draft of the prayers, visualizations that he particularly injects into the first seven prayers, which are petitionary prayers. Before you can start the practice of the 30 prayers, you actually have to have a sort of licensing vision of the Virgin Mary to go on. We have all of these visualizations. We have figures that go with all of the prayers in the book. In the original text, there were some 92 figures in the book. They're not actually preserved in the Bodleian manuscript. We think there was a, probably a choir that went missing early on. But we have descriptions of the lettering that went on all of them. And we have a couple of the figures preserved, and we have some other figures that are actually described, enabling them to be to some extent recreated. And all the figures that we get with the new compilation are actually described. We have several copies where they've been executed, but they're executed quite differently by different authors. Anyway, so all of these prayers presuppose a quite complicated strategy of holding in your mind simultaneously an image a prayer that you're saying while looking at a picture John also says that any of the visualizations if it will help you you can make a drawing of so everything that he recommends as a visualization could also become a figure if you want to and then you go to sleep wow. obviously this is going to put you into a or you're going you're to lie down anyway and you're going to probably go into a uh, some kind of a near sleep state and if you're like John this may happen fairly quickly and you'll be able to see all kinds of things right away if you're more like his friend John of Fontaine Jean, maybe it won't work for you. I think probably the way that all of these things worked had to do with the particular kind of focus you get from these various sort of divided brain activities, particularly if they're done at a point prior to sleep. But again, as I say, that's a speculation, but that's what seems probable to me just from the information we have about how these things are supposed to be used. If you want to try it, just remember, <laughs> obviously there's practice that's going on, right? It's not a thing that anybody is going to just be able to immediately sit down and do, I should think. One of the sections of your Conjuring Spirits compilation, it first released in 1998, is a beautiful section and discussion on the actual notai themselves, and there's several examples. I know Joseph Peterson was the first person to kind of clue me into it on his Esoteric Archives website, saying, hey, if you want a discussion about the notai, check out, obviously, Conjuring Spirits. And there's a beautiful section, and you're right, Claire, I mean, it, it almost reminds me of like contemplative mysticism. It's, it, it's like using these no tie as a kind of icon where they, like you say there's multiple levels of consciousness going on there I mean it's right. fascinating Although I think they're not really iconic in any kind of traditional sense because of the way that they frustrate expectation because of the ways that they are really designed to trick you into sort of suspending your consciousness without understanding what's underneath it I think it's a, just a way of holding your attention that they're designed to encourage John John doesn't specifically mention 
the no tie when he talks about using the Ars Antoria. He more talks about using the prayers, which may or may not mean that the no tie were optional. But the fact that he had subjoins this enormous book of figures to his own work makes it pretty clear that he saw they were important in some way, I think. In the 2012 book that you edited, um, Invoking Angels, there's a huge discussion about Jewish and Islamic influences on some of these esoteric texts. Can you just kind of share with the listeners, Claire, who might not be too familiar, like what was the topography intellectually in Europe during the time of John the Monk in terms of dealing with all these influences? I think this is a really important area. And I think there's all kinds of exchange going on. It's interesting to think about because you have, well, first off, just Europe generally is being affected. This is at the right at the tail end of the 13th century. You have had all of these texts coming out, mostly out of Spain, that are translations of many, many Arabic texts, including quite a large number of magic texts. You have translation going on, not just in the primary places in Spain where the translations also were being facilitated. So you have Arabic translations that are in some cases being facilitated by speakers of Hebrew. You have translations going not only from Arabic and Hebrew into Latin, you also have Latin going back into Hebrew. There is a recent set of books that are edited by Haim Hames and some others on Latin into Hebrew texts. And one of the interesting things about that is that it works the same way in the sense that they're not just interested in science Science that's going on. They're interested in theology and ritual. Hames has edited a Hebrew translation of Ramon Lull's Ars Brevis, and that's one of the things that he talks about in his article for Invoking Angels. Kate Mesler talked about the fact that we can just actually see and pick out three different levels, different types of angelology in the text of the Sworn Book of Honorius. And they show influence from all three cultures. You get some of the same thing if you look at Baron Garganel's Summa Sacre Magicae, which is something that's put together right in the same period in, in Spain where John is writing in France, maybe a little later, but the first half of the 14th century. And it's got all kinds of really interesting Hebrew texts and Hebrew practices and Hebrew alphabets which are incorporated into figures. There's a figure that's a ro- rotations of the divine name and things like that. So I think that people were, first off, really, really interested. In my article in Invoking Angels, I talk about how John of Morigny has actually got Hebrew letters written into his text. Someone suggested to me, in fact, that his model, the model that we get in the Bodleian manuscript of the divine name, has to have been written by a Jewish scribe. How did that even happen? We don't know very much. Like, he doesn't say too much. He talks about having a quarrel with some Jews. This is the only thing that he says in the entirety of his text about Judaism. And yet we have divine name in Hebrew. We have a Hebrew alphabet. We have an example of the divine name that looks like it was written by a Hebrew scribe. Where do we go from there? We have a Hebrew alphabet that's actually kind of mucked up and was definitely not copied. I think it was probably originally a correctly done alphabet, but copied by someone. It looks like it was uh, originally written on two lines and then copied by someone who was working from the wrong direction onto three lines so that it's got like pieces are, are broken off. It doesn't go in order. It doesn't go in the order that it would be in Hebrew except for in patches. So we have different levels of knowledge and engagement with these texts. But you know, there's something else too in this, which is that new little bits of Hebrew are turning up all the time. Gideon Bohawk recently identified a little patch of Hebrew from the Sheer Coma in Richard Kickheffer's Forbidden Rites. And it was basically correct. Basically, uh, recognizable Hebrew is in that book. So one of the things that I think is really important, actually, because I think that we haven't had, and we're beginning to have, like we're just beginning to get over the past decade, more kind of collaboration between people who read Latin and read Hebrew and Arabic. Just over the last decade, we're beginning to look at things like how does the Arabic picatrix compare to the Latin version of the same thing? What happens in the translation from one culture to another? We've started having people like, to have Kitchen Bohawk, I 
identify a piece of Hebrew in a Latin, a basically a Latin magic text, is huge. And I don't think before really recently, I remember when I first met Chaim Hames, I wanted him to look at the Ars Notoria and just tell me what he saw because I wanted to know what it looked like to him. And I think there's still a whole world of things to be discovered, a whole world of kind of interreligious exchange and particular interest in one another's rituals. There's there's a lot of stuff also in the old compilation text of John's figures that shows up a clear pretty clear to me anyway, Hebrew influence, even on the way that he's forming angel names. I showed it to Kate Mesler when I was in Jerusalem, and she said, yeah, yeah, so tell me about these things that you think are Jewish. <laughs> and I said, well, and I described <laughs> them, and she was like, oh, really? Just name formations, things like that. And I think there's a lot of stuff that's traveling around that we don't know enough about yet. This is my moral. This is where our research has to go. This is what we have to start doing. We've got to have more people collaborating on different sides of the language divide, more people working together. From where I sit, it looks like there's a lot more exchange that's specifically an exchange of like religious texts that's going on between these three cultures. To that point, Claire, we have a question from Aaron Leach who says, I'm curious about Claire's thoughts on what she and her academic colleagues think about the modern resurgence of interest in the grimoires, meaning the traditional crowd, not the demonologists, but as a practical system of spirituality. Zach Phoenix says, can you please ask Claire if she is aware of where there might be new grimoire texts to be found, or maybe where there are some that are incorrectly indexed or archived? And then Farber Markland says, says, I'd really like to hear Claire's opinion on what she thinks we need to change in our study of these texts, which you've already mm-hmm. intimated, um, and what can we do better? So it seems yeah. like all three of those listeners, Claire, are asking, to your point, you know, where are the current gaps and mm-hmm. where do you think we are right now? Right. I think there's definitely more fields to till in the area of interreligious discourse and sort of discursive transfers from one language into another, from one religion into another. That's something that we need to look at. Like, that's a going concern right now. But it doesn't hurt for me to to push it, I think. So to all my listeners, if you know Latin... Study Hebrew. <laughs> if you know Hebrew, study Arabic. It, you know, just like try and keep those languages moving because that's where there are discoveries to be made. And I think that's a really important thing. And the other part is to discovering new manuscripts and where I think they're going to be. They're all over the place, really. I mean, there's a ton of stuff still that I haven't had time to touch myself that could fruitfully be transcribed and edited. But as to finding new manuscripts, I think one of the places that people don't normally look for this stuff, like everybody kind of knows to connect magic texts with kind of scientific and and all chemical. So for example, one thing that people use for looking at magic manuscripts is the index of uh, scientific and all chemical manuscript in that was done by Thorndike and Kyber, I think. I think there's a lot of stuff that maybe needs to be looked at in the category of liturgical manuscripts. The Bodleian manuscript of John of Morini actually is classified as a liturgical manuscript, and they have a whole bunch of these. And like Frank Claussen, when, when we first discovered this, he was kind of annoyed because he was like, well, there's nothing, there was nothing to suggest there was a magic manuscript here. Well, no, that's the way John of Morini is. A lot of people didn't even think of it as magic, right? A lot of the monks that were using it have it classified as a prayer book, and that's not wrong. That's not actually wrong. It's actually true it is a prayer book. It's just the prayers are not kind of what you expect. One of the things I should say about liturgy is that it's in just as bad a shape as magic in the sense that there's tons and tons and tons of stuff that nobody's looked at. People know the sort of main sacramentaries and the main rites, and they know what people did, but there's a huge class of manuscripts, especially in the kind of the later you get, the more of these there are just like sort of miscellaneous prayer books. I have found a couple of 15th century prayer books one of which has a whole set of very much abbreviated but still recognizable prayers from John's Libra Florum that are just described as good and useful prayers, and they're not attributed, they're not said to be from any kind of magic text or any kind of other text. They're not, nobody would know that they were John of Morini if I hadn't been able to recognize them. This is in a really fat book, you know, something like sort of 
like a lot of a lot of uh, different choirs stuck together, probably somewhat miscellaneous, compiled over a very long period. There's other weird texts that have prayers for learning, prayers for eloquence. These turn up just randomly in prayer books. And there's one of my kind of case in point. This is one of the reasons, one of the things that I'm trying to look at now a little bit. There's a prayer that is attributed very broadly to a Franciscan saint, St. Anthony of Padua, who was a follower of St. Francis, late 13th century-ish. Along around the 15th century, there's a prayer that starts getting attributed to him that is actually from the Ars Notori, but it's a prayer that's supposed to be a good little prayer for eloquence. And St. Anthony of Padua was known for his eloquence, and it was said to be a prayer that he wrote and said before he had to go out and preach. So this is this holy devotional little prayer, and it's been affixed to the front of all of the later vitae of St. Anthony of Padua as simply a devotional prayer, but it actually comes from the Ars Notoria. So there's some kind of transfer that's going on between magic and particularly um, monasticism, I would say. If you look at, I mean, John Morini is just like an absolutely, a, a very eloquent case in point of someone that's just a... He's a liturgist. He's very interested in, in standard liturgy. In his first seven prayers, he combines more literary forms and more existing prayers than you can imagine. He takes whole long poems and rearranges them and adds his own parts to them. He's got masses that get compiled, and it shows that he's not simply a magic guy, but he's a liturgy guy. He's a hoarder and rearranger and person who's really interested in all liturgical texts and documents, and he puts them together with other texts like what the Ars Notoria, which he also sees as, an, as a liturgical text text. He reconfigures it. He reframes it in very much the same way that he does with standard liturgies, right? It's my feeling that if people start diving into just prayer books, there's masses of prayers out there that nobody's even looked at because there's just too much stuff, right? There's too much stuff. A lot of them could turn out to be kind of interesting, I think. We'll be able to see more about how magic and ordinary prayer relate if we start reading more of those books. So that's one of the places that I would look. We have a question, Claire, from Adam J. Pearson, who says, I'd love to ask Dr. Fanger if she could please comment on her view of the development of the Black Mirror scrying tradition in ceremonial magic. Does she see this as a 19th century innovation or as having older roots since we have no evidence that D used the mirror attributed to him in the British Museum based on any of his writings? If so, can Claire comment on some key texts that she's come across that employ a black mirror of art in magical operations? I can do this really quickly, I think. I would say that the idea of a black mirror probably is a pragmatic one. A lot of the materials, I have an article that I wrote on medieval catoptromancy, but one of the points is that you can use all kinds of things. You can use any sort of shiny thing. And I think anybody that does this kind of scrying typically probably uses a variety of things to see stuff in. Miss X, who had an article on... So I'm jumping into the 19th century now. It has not to do with the Middle Ages, but I, I think it's illuminating. This is a an article that she wrote called Experiments in Crystal Vision in... I can't remember what year of the Journal of Society for the Psychical Research. This was actually first handed on to me by Robert Matheson, but it's a really interesting piece and she talks very pragmatically about what you need to do this right to do this kind of practice and she says one of her favorite th tricks like she's a person that has a photographic memory and she can use her photographic memory if she has a reflective surface to find data like she describes one day she couldn't remember the date she's writing a letter and so if she calls into her mind an image of today's paper and just moves it around until she can see the date up in the corner she will know that that's correct and she'll write it down because she can remember the whole front page of the paper. That's part of how she thinks this works. So she says one of her favorite things to use is a photograph, a glass-covered photograph that's hung on the side of the room from which the light enters, which is interesting because it, it's essentially a dark mirror. She's talking about something that is functioning as a dark mirror that simply helps her to do this practice that she does. So if we look back to the medieval text, then from that vantage, first off, we see that even in 19th 19th century cases, people are using all kinds of things, not just a dedicated ball that's been made or mirror that's been made for that purpose. They're using all kinds of things to do this. So we similarly, we 
are finding in medieval and even classical texts that we have a lot of different implements. A shoulder blade that's been rubbed with oil, that's going to be kind of dark. A knife or a sword that's been rubbed with oil, again, kind of dark, kind of reflective. There's one of the most common things that you run across in medieval texts is onicomancy, where they're using a fingernail that's been rubbed with oil, and usually a boy medium. And one of the directives that I've read for this is that the padre, the priest, presumably that's actually forcing this little boy to do this diabolic practice, has to sit with his back to the light. So we're getting instructions that have to do with the way light falls that are designed to enhance the surface so that it appears dark. So I think that a dark mirror is kind of just a natural next step from all of the things that people were probably using all along that were not actually highly reflective. They weren't anything like the highly reflective surface that you get in a white crystal ball or even in a dark one. Probably they were rough. They were dark. They were oiled to make them a little bit shiny. They were carefully positioned with respect to the light so that there wasn't a glare you know, essentially. And I think that we're seeing a kind of technology developing when they start to, to actually make things that are dedicated for the purpose. They make them dark because that's the easiest thing to use pragmatically. And I think this listener question dovetails perfectly in, into that. Uh, this is a question from Aaron Leach. Can you please have Claire speak about the role of female Solomonic practitioners in the medieval and Renaissance eras? Or, or we could just focus on the medieval. Not only were women valued as scribes, but to his understanding, it was not at all uncommon for cunning women to practice magic from the grimoires or at least claim to possess them as their sources of power. In many cases, such women were Eve prostitutes who used the magic not only to sell services, but also to survive in a world that offered such ladies zero protection. I could be wrong about any or all of this, of course, so I'd love to hear what Claire has to say. Is there anything you'd like to comment on there, Claire? A couple of things, like for the most part, when you're looking at female practitioners, especially when you're looking at prostitutes, you're well out of the Middle Ages by that point. And one of the things that I can say, sort of to put it in perspective, is that you don't really have enough lay literacy in the medieval period for most women to use Solomonic texts on their own. The later you get into the Middle Ages and the more you're into the early modern period, you start having a much broader swath of society that can actually read and can actually collect texts. And so when you start having women practitioners of written texts, that's going to be in the early modern period. So if we go back to Solomonic magic in the medieval period, I think the, probably the most illuminating example of the way that it probably worked, and this is the way things worked for many women, many women that began as lay women, oh God, to start reading late. I've already mentioned that John of Morigny taught his sister Bridget when she was just 15 to read using the Ars Notoria. This is a, a young woman that gets access to Solomonic text early on in life, but she's being led by, she's actually asked her brother, he says that he starts out, he wants to make sure that she really wants to do this and commit to it because he says she's old enough that it's maybe not going to be that easy for her to learn how to read. She may not even be able to do it at all. People were well aware that there was kind of a window for reading, but he became convinced that she really wanted to do it and he thought probably that it would be easy for her to learn from the Ars Notoria. I think there were several reasons for this. One of the most common texts for teaching children to read was a primer, so that what you're teaching from, what mothers would teach their children from, would typically be a little prayer book that was actually designed, it was designed with simple prayers that the child might already know by heart. And this is always an, an aid, like there are things that the children are learning to say from an early age, especially if they're from a, a family of gentry. Since they already know the prayer, they can look at it and they can sort of associate the sounds to it. Well, what you have within the Ars Notoria is, first off, a set of prayers. The prayers, even though they're not exactly the same as the ones Bridget was hearing in church, would have had a lot of phraseology in common, there would be things about God and about, you know, stuff that she was kind of familiar with. There would be bits, bits and patches of scripture. Um, so he sat her down and taught her with this 
text and he says that she learned to read very well in a marvelously short time and she was able to read an alleluia in church with uh, nobody's help and all by herself as eloquently i think he said as an angel as just she were an angel to sing it by yourself so she does learn to read using the ars notoria but then she immediately starts having the same kind of dark demonic visions that john of morini had when he was using the text and i have relatively little doubt that one of the things that he was probably getting her to do was to write, recite those strings. I mean, both from the fact that she's getting the demonic vision, so he's not just using stra the straightforward Latin prayers, he's having her read these very difficult, they would have forced her to break it down letter by letter and to read each letter individually. I have a dyslexic daughter, so I'm just going to put this in. She had trouble learning to read as well, and one of the things I noticed about her reading acquisition is that it took her quite a long time to before she had, and I'm still not sure she has any recognition of whole words so that whereas my older daughter learned to read very fast and she had an almost immediate recognition of words like the and, and basic prepositions and the short words that you saw all the time, everything travels, like flows very fast if you can recognize those. The younger ones seem to be decoding it letter by letter no matter how much we practice. She didn't absorb single words. Well, so what Rachel's essentially learned to do, sorry Rachel if you listen to this, I'm telling about things that maybe you don't want everyone to know, but what she had to do was simply learn to decode a whole a lot faster. There's a certain pace at which you have to be able to read for any comprehension to occur. And it's hard to do if you're dyslexic or if you are reading really slowly. It's hard to get comprehension out of it or you're breaking down letter by letter every single word that you're looking at. Just, you just can't get it done fast enough to really remember it. So one of the things those patterns of letters would have done for someone that couldn't read yet would have probably enhanced the skill of actually letter by letter decoding. So it probably would have worked. That's a theory that I put for. Again, a lot of this is kind of speculative, but I mean, I can't not think about it, right? When I'm thinking about how this happened and how it worked for the people doing it. So anyway, so back to the question, which is, I would say that in the Middle Ages, a lot of the women, especially lay women that are actually learning stuff, like they work through males. They have to work through males. So if you have medieval women that are actually doing Solomonic magic, as Bridget actually was, they're probably leaning on, um, I would guess, at a guess, a male relative of some kind who's introducing it to them. We don't have much written about this because, of course, the women in many cases don't learn to write themselves. Although we do know that Bridget learned to read, and some of them would have done so, but w whether they would have gotten far enough to be writing well, visionary autobiographies is anybody's guess. However, I'll be very interested as I get further into my study of prayers as to whether we find any more women like this. How they learn to read and what kind of texts they're coming in contact with and so on is a very interesting topic. To that point, Claire, I have the last listener question from Joseph H. Peterson, who's been on the podcast uh, mm -hmm. multiple times, who said, I heard Claire give a paper once on the origin and evolution of the word grimoire. Her findings, Joseph Peterson says, deserve a wider audience, and I bet your listeners in particular would appreciate a recap. So I know that this is a huge topic, but just kind of the broad strokes, Claire, I mean, where did this word come from? It's actually not a, not a medieval word. I mean, that's sort of to spill all the beans at once. The story that I gave in that talk basically delineated a scenario in which the word is not used of anything but fictional books. Like, it starts out as a word that's completely relegated to fictional books, that is, books of an idea about a book by which demons are conjured. It comes up, for example, this is a quotation from 15, about 1582, Jean Baudin's De Monomanie des Sorciers, and Baudin was actually a Catholic, though he's a reformist Catholic, so it's hard to sense what's really going on here. I quote, It was not long ago, and in the memory of our fathers, that publicly, when one wanted to canonize those who had a reputation for sanctity, one would read out a certain book full of invocations. This was done at night. The book was called the Grimoire and kept secret, of which I make absolutely no judgment so long as the thing is done in a holy manner and to a good end. But I well know that it is a damnable thing to make use of necromancy and put questions to the devil, the father of lies about the truth of hidden things. So he's adducing a book which is actually used to canonize saints. Thank <laughs> you. 
That is, there's obviously some anti-Catholic invective that's gone into the development of this idea of a book that's being picked up by a Catholic for whatever reason. And this this book, this kind of this grimoire text, gets a lot of play in subsequent ideas of the of the grimoire. Obviously, it's not a real book. Obviously, nobody in this it gets play as a book where by the devil is called up. There's various references to it in later texts. You do not have anybody referring to a grimoire that's a book of necromancy in the medieval period, and you certainly do not have any book that's actually called a grimoire until uh, about the 17th century. You start the uh, 17th century, 18th century, you start getting books that are books of magic that have grimoire in the title. Many of them are spuriously backdated to the 14th to 16th centuries so and fake dates on them. But if any time that you see a book that has grimoire in the title, you already know that that's a modern book. It's not a medieval book. The word grimoire is actually from the French, and it's not a Latin word, and it has no Latin cognate. So this is the other thing, when you find a Latin title like Grimoireum Verum, where it sounds like Latin, it's fake Latin because it's actually not a Latin word. It's, been, it's a French word that's been Latinized and been put to the title of a book. We don't have anything earlier than Jean Baudin. Anything that occurs sort of in the 16th century is a reference to a fictional book. That's the scope of it. And there's no Latin word for the Grimoire is not a Latin word. There's no medieval Latin word that is an analog of it. Claire, that is fantastic. I know listeners will really appreciate that as well. And the last question, Claire, is can you share with our listeners about this new study of prophecy, mm -hmm. prayers, and dreams, and how this weaves into angel magic? What would you like listeners to know? After dealing with John of Morini, realizing how important the science of dreams was for him, there was a point in actually reading his final book where I realized that he was, and this is partly in his defense of his own work as a science of dreams, he talks about himself also as having a gift of prophecy, and he refers to himself as being in the lineage of the Old Testament prophets, and in fact, that is sort of part of his defense, is that he is in the class of people that is monks and contemplatives to whom God gives the gift of prophecy. He is part of a recognized order that goes all the way back, that if God is going to talk to anyone, it's going to be a monk, right? That's, that's his premise. And I'm like, okay, whoa, this is like, really? So I wanted to find out how, um, <laughs> how many monks, and apparently they all thought this way pretty much, but how many monks were thinking like this, and how, many, how often do you find solicited visions in monastic literature, and how does this come together with the practice, practices like the Ars Notoria, where you're actually praying for illumination? And so most of this year, I've been steeping myself in the writings of not too well-known Benedictine, 12th century Benedictine named Rupert of Deutz. Even some medievalists haven't heard of, has mostly not translated, but he has this really fascinating visionary memoir that is encapsulated in Book 12 of his uh, a commentary on Matthew, in which he relates all of these visionary dreams that he had, a number of which I would say are at least indirectly solicited, and one of which is distinctly solicited in a prayer. It's a complicated, very fascinating piece of work. It shows all kinds of expectations around the act of praying and all kinds of intimations about this very personal relation with God that he has. So when he's going to solicit a dream, the ways that he does so have certain things in common with certainly the expectations and practices that John of Maureen uses in his own sort of prayer book. Obviously, this is like 200 years before John of Maureen, but he's doing things already that are seem to be in a very similar similar vein. A lot of the dreams, for example, a lot of the things that his visions occur when he's in a state where he clearly specifies that he's either sleeping lightly or kind of on the edge of sleep, which kind of backs up my hunch that that's the phase of sleep in which John of Maureen is actually seeing the things that he sees. He does, like John of Maureen, the, the getting of an answer to a vision. I have a recent article, actually, that I published in Magic Ritual and Witchcraft, and I think it was uh, 20, issue 1 of 2018 
2013, sometime last year anyway. I talk about sort of crossover. I talk about solicited visions and I talk about monastic practice and also about the different practices you get for soliciting visions in magic across the board from Picatrix to Ars Notoria. I talk about the similarities that they seem to have. One of the other things that is similar to John and much prior monastics to him is that Typically, you don't get a prayer and have necessarily have a dream right away. It's implied all of the time that you're engaged on a more or less ongoing practice of praying. And this is true in John of Morini and in the Ars Notoria. And it's also true where you have monks and nuns praying for visions to answer questions. And sometimes, like for some holy men and holy women too this was a thing that they were asked to do you see this in both Hildegard of Bingen and Elizabeth of Chernau people say what can you tell us about like the date of the Feast of the Assumption when is it really and they have to get answers to these questions and it doesn't happen right away so they start praying they might have a specific prayer that they're using or they might have a prayer that someone gave them that was said to be good for getting visions. Sometimes this is actually mentioned, but they'll say it over and over until it happens. And it can take any amount of time between a few days to a few weeks to a year, like before you get an answer to the question that you've been petitioning for. There's a sense in which it's not an automatic response. Reading between the lines, what you have to see is that, first off, you've got ongoing practices of prayer in the monasteries, and you also have people that are in an ongoing way meditating on a certain issue that they have, or a certain question that they have, or a question someone asked them, or something that puzzles them in a line of scripture. And they're praying every night before they go to sleep, and monks aren't sleeping very much anyway, so you're going to sp be spending a lot of time in that sort of window space between sleep and waking. And over time, they have dreams that feel illuminative, that feel like in some way but not always the question has been answered sometimes it's not answered the way that they want sometimes it's not directly answered but they look, have ways of reading it that imply something for the way they have to go on living their lives so one of the really interesting things is that the question that Rupert of Deutz asks to have answered when he does this very specific bit of vision solicitation is a question explaining a dream that he had earlier that suggested he was only going to live for eight more years from that time and now it's been seven years and he's gotten all worried about it so he prays for an answer and he gets this massive mystical experience of the kind that most saints would be just like wow that's it that's the end I understand everything and he's sort of like that this was amazing but they didn't answer my question you know, <laughs> he's like really, really disappointed. Uh, yeah, it's like all of that. And it's like, wait a second, my initial question was not. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, well, one of one of John of Morini's biggest dreams actually comes when Christ comes to tell him he shouldn't be doing this kind of divination. It's like his most important dream. And it's the one that really makes him think twice about the Ars Notoria. So you often have them people praying for something then the divinity and this is the really interesting thing for me about studying the way that solicited visions are handled you very often have answers that are not what you want or not what you expect or go against the desire that you have in some kind of way so you have to deal with that so but i think overall it's a very interesting set of practices basically and you can see how I feel like they're all kind of interlinked. And I started to feel as well like the sense of being a monk was a big piece of what made these practices feel normal, what made it feel normal for John to write about a science of dreams not feel outrageous or like sort of theologically suspect because he's dealing with the monastic theology in which this has sort of been an ingrained idea for a really long time. As you continue that study and that kind of interweaving of prophecy, prayers, and dreams and, and how it relates to, to these different areas, of course, Claire, we'd love it if you would like to to come back on and, and really just do a deep dive into that because I think that's just a fascinating topic in and of itself. As we wrap up here, Claire, is there anything else that you wanted to touch on or is there any place that you'd like to direct listeners to if they'd like to find out a little bit more? Obviously, I'm going to make sure to link to your Conjuring Spirits and Invoking Angels editions that you edited, but is there anything else that you'd like the listeners yeah, well, to know? Yeah, the article that I was just talking about that came out in Magic Ritual and Witchcraft is called Divine Dream Work. There's another thing I did that's kind of similar. It's looking at monastic practice on Adam Roberts' side view, which is called Inscription on the Heart. It's about people reporting or manufacturing experiences of God writing on their hearts. Dr. Claire Fanger, thank you so much for just taking the time and joining us on the podcast today. 
Thank you, Alex. Listeners, what an honor to have an esoteric scholar like Dr. Claire Fanger stop by to share her wisdom about John of Morini, the Ars Notoria, and the science of dreams. Thanks as well goes to Annalise Antoinette for her exquisite assistance for this episode specifically and her encouragement as well. And thanks as always, listeners, goes directly to you for always kicking butt and taking the time to enjoy the podcast. In the meantime, you can subscribe and check out previous episodes and other magical Glitch Bottle news on YouTube, youtube.com slash Glitch Bottle, and you can download and listen to podcast episodes on iTunes, Spotify, Spreaker.com, and Stitcher Radio. Please make sure to subscribe and follow us on YouTube, and if you subscribe, make sure to hit that little notification bell for new episodes as soon as they post, and you can always follow Glitch Bottle on Twitter at Glitch Bottle, all one word. Our intro music is the track Tornado by David Zeste. Our magical interest is fueled by sincerity, passion, amazing guests, and a copious amount of clinking coffee cups. Until next time, this is Alexander F. reminding you to invoke often, uncork the uncommon, and keep the light. Ah!